to go play in the street. I'm going to go let you play with electric sockets. I mean, what Jesus is saying, I'm sending you out sheep. Like, what kind of shepherd? And yet Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. So why does he let these terrible things happen? And yet, in Hebrews 13, he says, he's the great shepherd. It's because we think that going through the tough times is the ultimate end. And it's not. Because as you read on, he says, be on guard. You will be handed over to local councils and flogged and synagogues. And circle this in your Bible. This is why he sends you out. He says, on my account. On my account, I send you out. And you will be brought to governors and kings and witness to them and to the Gentiles. But when you are arrested, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. Do you get this? It, the whole purpose is that you are already saved. You already know Jesus. That if you were to die at this very moment, you are going to heaven. Because of obedience and to faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross and the resurrection. But the kings and the governors and the schools and the, and the workforce do not know Jesus. And he says, I will give you the words to speak. Do you get this? Is that all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes in you. And he gives you the power to endure what you are about to endure. Thank you. <laughs> because he's, the Father is speaking through you. And then read at this very end. He says, be, he says, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. It's those people in that China church that their tongues get cut out and they said, I won't quit. And, uh, you know, being here for, this is like coming on my ninth year being here in this position and, and just love Canyon View and was saved down at the, on the North Avenue Church and came to know Jesus. And, and uh, I, I look back at what a difference nine years have made. And when we, we started, we started doing things like um, making peanut butter and jellies. I mean, if, some of you guys have been around here a long time. We had high schools that contacted us and said, could you bring peanut butter and jellies in? And we did. And, and pretty soon we were in all four high schools. And, but there was this one high school that really didn't want us there. Because we used to put little cards in it called Jesus cards, and they were, they were always the I am's of Jesus. I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am the bread. And we would put these cards in, and this principal said, you can't do this because it's a, church, a thing of being um, church and state. You guys ever hear those things, right? And so this principal said, you can't do this. And, and we said, oh, yes, we can. We have a right to do this. And th what I've learned is you can be right but not righteous, and we had a right. And so we said, we're going to. And so we brought the peanut butter and jellies to this high school, and she took them away from us. <laughs> and he's like, oh, no, you just didn't. <laughs> and so one of the high school kids, the principal's carrying, they're in these boxes, the Frito-Lay box in their bags, and the principal's carrying it up to her office. This high school senior runs up, grabs the bag's out of her box, and she's yelling at him, stop, stop, stop. And he's grabbing, and he says, have your Jesus food. Have your Jesus food. <laughs> and she's chasing him, and he's running. <laughs> Next morning, we're called in. And, <laughs> and, 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 it, and what I found is, and we just said, take us to court. I think we're right. I think we have a constitutional right to practice our faith the way we want. I think we have a right to assemble the way we want. I think we have, and you know what? We were right, but weren't righteous. We didn't respect the authority that was there. And so now, I just got a, uh, Jerry Retz, who works with me, or I actually work with him. And, well, he works a lot more than I do. Um, we, we still do the peanut butter and jellies in R5, and we don't ever really talk about it because R5 doesn't have a lunch program. And they asked us, could you still do this for us? And we've been doing it for the last five years every Wednesday. And, uh, and Jerry still puts the cards in. And Jerry still goes down there and hugs on them. And Jerry was just nominated for, from the school district as volunteer of the year. <laughs> Is is that you can be right and be wrong, 
But when you walk humbly with your God and you seek justice and mercy, then he's with you. And then, and then people are drawn to him. And people come to Jerry and, and they hug on him and, and, they, and, and they come meet us. And we're at Mesa State. We've been kicked out of Mesa State. We go out there. But every week we come out to the corner of Mesa State and we hand out about uh, 400 bag lunches. And we get, we get this letter from this lady. We were kicked out of Mesa State and yet we had a right to be there. And we could have fought it. But I said, no, that's the submission. And uh, we get this letter from these kids because we go there every Thursday and we hand out Bibles and we pray with kids and we, we pray for their grades and we pray for their situation and breakups and all that. And there's a group of people that just faithfully do this every week. You know, we've handed out over 50,000 chicken sandwiches and God just gives it to us and we just give it away. And, uh, and this is what this letter says. We know this isn't a formal thank you card, but however, we felt the need to tell you how much what your group does to help out. We are college students, and some weeks the things are really tough. But you guys given up your day in helping out, not only by supplying food, but also bringing friendly smiles to everyone who stops by. We just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for all that you do, not only for us, but for all the other lives that you touch on a weekly basis. Honestly, thank you for just being there every Thursday. Your group is fantastic. The food is wonderful. I'd question that. And thank you. <laughs> Once you've eaten 50,000 chicken sandwiches, it's not that good. <laughs> Keep inspiring others to do great things and spread smiles. Sincerely, two college kids that are fully appreciative of all you guys do. Is that you can be right <laughs> or you can be righteous. And, you know, what we learned... We could do, we used to do this thing called Freedom Fest where we literally gave out 10,000 bottles of water and did this thing and had the big band and, and it was amazing. We had thousands of people come out and it was, we'd bump and jumps and all this. And but what we found is you can draw a crowd, but you're not building a community. And what Jesus was wanting to do, he's not into the crowd business as you can tell by his messages, right? He's into community business and building it into his kingdom. And so what we moved away from is from the Freedom Fest stuff to invading communities. And when we go to door to door, I knock on doors and pray with people and hand out Bibles and just be with them and help them. I know Diane's here, she'd be very embarrassed with it, but help kids get their GEDs and help kids who never could play sports play sports. And, and all of a sudden we have this Kimwood community that we have a couple hundred people that come out and they have a service and we pray with them and we do all these things. Is that is what we're about. And, and you can be right, and we could battle with the city and the parks and all that, or you could be righteous and find a community that desperately needs Jesus. And so, this is the, the part I don't do very well. And, uh, and this is in Matthew 9, 36. And, and it, this is the part where Jesus looks upon the crowd and he, he says, Jesus looked upon the crowd and he had compassion for them. And he says, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then he says, and he tells the disciples, so his 12 disciples are around him. He says, pray for them. He says, pray earnestly to the Father in heaven or the Lord of the harvest for workers. Do you get that? Is that he didn't say, go pray for Sally because she has a roof problem. Or go help Sally because she has a roof problem. Or go help Billy because he doesn't have food. Or go help Mary because she has a demon. What he says is pray for the church. He says pray earnestly for the church. And then he, the Father, will send more people to do the work. But our job as the church is to pray. Not only to worship, but we come to pray. And so, did you guys have fun worshiping out in the middle of the service? All right. You guys trust me, right? All right, a little bit. On your tear. On your chair. These are some of our missionaries that we have that are really going through it right now. And, uh, and what we are at Canyon View Vineyard, because right now you're a crowd, and our desire is that we become a community. And then when we move from a community, we move into communion with God because it says two or more are there, I'm with you. And so right now, I'm going to ask you guys to do something really crazy because I believe God's word is true. Do you believe that's true? Do you believe that two or more 
he is with you. Do you believe that whatever you ask for is given and when you pray in his name? And so what I'm going to ask you to do is I want you to group together in five or six or eight people. I want you to introduce yourself because we're a community. Does that sound scary? All right, I know it's scary, but you're all Christians and you love each other, right? So I'm going to ask you to eat together. And on the back of the card, it asks these missionaries send in a prayer request this week and said, would you have your church pray for us? Can we pray for these guys? And you can pray out loud or you can pray to yourself or just introduce yourself and let's just pray for them. And let's just see what God's going to do. Can we do that for the next five minutes? Is that scary? A little bit? All right. Get up. Move around. Trust me, church. <laughs> introduce each other. Okay. What I love is that the Lord says he's in the midst, and you can feel his presence here right now. And uh, th those are just a few of the missionaries. We have over 40 missionaries that the, the support. And, and every uh, time we do a tithe or offering, 10% of it goes to our missionaries to do the amazing work that they're doing. And uh, right now, uh, Pastor Kirk is actually in Japan right now with one of our missionaries teaching healing service and kingdom business because in Japan, less than 0.5% of the people in Japan knows Jesus. But 200 miles across the sea in a nation called South Korea, there's over 50% of people who know Jesus. And you know what the difference is between South Korea and Japan besides 200 miles? 
is that they fervently seek Jesus in prayer. That they get together at four in the morning and they fill up soccer stadiums and they pray out loud. And all of a sudden they're seeing revival happen and people's lives changing. They're seeing healings. They're seeing a hunger for God's work. And, and they're getting in small groups. And he says, that's what we want to see that happens in Japan. And that's what we want to see happens in Grand Junction. And so to be in a live church, I'd like to invite our ushers forward. To be in a live church, it's a church that worships God fervently. Because that's what he called the Israelites out in, when they were in bondage. He says he wanted them to be set free so they could go into the wilderness and worship their God. And it's a church that prays fervently with earnestly believe in expectation that God hears prayers and he changes life situations. I guarantee you everyone who has ever come to know Jesus had someone praying for them. And then that's why we got to pray together. And that's why it's important we get in a community together. And the last thing is, is open your Bibles to uh, Luke 9, or Luke 12, excuse me. And then Jesus says this, in a live church, he says, do not be afraid. And the number one thing that you put on the cross and you put in the God can't, or God, I can't, but God can thing is worry and fear. And this is what Jesus' word was to this church. He says, do not be afraid, little flock. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. He is pleased to give this to you. He's excited about giving you this kingdom. That's what he talks about in the blessed and the beatitudes. And then he says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that do not wear out and treasures in heaven that will never fail, where no thief can come steal or no moth can destroy. For where your treasure is, your heart will also be. It is a church that gives sacrificially, that gives not out of abundance, but gives out of need. And you read the needs of the missionaries. And I can tell you, you know, this last week we helped people get, stay in their apartments. We helped keep electricity on. That we, that we you know, like I told you earlier, we feed over 2,000 people every week. And we're in 11 schools and at the college. And he said, this is the kind of church that's alive because God provides, and he wants a kind of congregation that gives, and I know you guys give, and I'm not trying to guilt you, but what if we were the kind of church, when that bucket passed, you put a penny in, a nickel in, I, because it is saying, I believe God can do more with what I'm about ready to give than what I can do with it. Do you believe that? And please, if you feel like I'm manipulating you or anything like that, then don't give, okay? Because that's, God just wants a cheerful giver. And, and this isn't my mode because every week I see God supply us in abundance. We, we, you know, hand out over 75 tons of food and we don't buy any of it, just given to us. So I know God provides. But I know this is a principle that you are actually storing stuff in heaven. And so, as we worship, we're going to pass the buckets around. Let's be the kind of church that gives generously. Yes. 
Keep it going. All right. Woo. Like that. All right. So uh, have a seat. You're, it ain't done yet. <laughs> There's too much church going on here. We need more church. We need a, I mean, I don't know about you, but I feel the presence of God. I feel alive. I feel that uh, I know that he shows up when we worship him, when we pray, when we give. And uh, so this is where... Ladies, I'm going to ask for your forgiveness before I even do it. It's like when I'm with my wife, the first thing I say in the morning, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm just going to say I'm sorry. But men, I'm talking to you, okay? I, mean, I really need your attention. And uh, for whatever reason, God has placed a particular role on us. And, um, and I think this message is to you wake up. And so, for you men, if you have your Bible, open it up. And we don't usually close a service like this, so please be patient with me. And this is in um, Luke 9, and verse 57. And it, the, the, the heading on it is called, The Cost of Following Jesus. And um, We do not want to be a church of Sardis, right? And so he's calling, the whole thing, the beatitude, he's calling people to follow him. And so it starts in 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. I know almost every man in here has said that. When they came to salvation, they said that. I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied this. Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. What he's telling him, he said, I'm not looking for a crowd because I'm looking for a follower. That if you're going to follow me, there's a chance that you might not have a home. But when you said yes the first time to Jesus, you meant it, right? No, there's two amens. Okay. And then Jesus said to another man, follow me. And then 
But he replied, Lord, let me go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury themselves. But go proclaim the kingdom of God. This is your role, man. To proclaim the kingdom of God in your home, in your workplace, and in your community. He's calling you out, and he's saying, follow me, and it is going to cost you. You will be persecuted. That's the promise. But what is it about? He sends you out like sheep among wolves. But he's looking for men because they're willing to accept the challenge. And then he said, but still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of kingdom. He says, seek the kingdom first and its righteousness and all else will follow. He's not saying abandon your family. He's saying, seek me first. And that's, we have a group of men in American church that does not know the Bible because no one has taught them. And that's what we're doing tonight, men. Right now, we're asking, we're, we're starting this thing called pods that we want iron to sharpen iron, that you get into the word of God, that you get together and pray, and we put you together in one year that you get through the entire Bible. And you have someone who's holding you accountable. No one goes to Gold Gym by themselves at first. What you are about to embark into, men, for the ones who say yes, will change your life, it will change your relationship with other men. It will change your family. It will change your walk with Jesus. But I know, because he's not looking for a crowd, he's looking for a follower. And so John Jessup is here, and he's our executive pastor, and, and he is the one who's in charge of this, and he wants some men who say yes to Jesus today. And so I'm going to close in prayer, and for you men who want to say yes, come forward after I'm done praying, and let's believe that we are not the church of Sardis but the church of Philadelphia that's known for its love. It's love for God and it's love for its people. Amen? Amen? So, Lord Jesus, thank you. Help us be the kind of church that just worships you full heartedly. Help us be a church that believes and prays to you and listens and obeys. And let us be the kind of church that just gives it all to you. Our time and our resources and our thoughts. Lord, I just repent that I'm not even close to that. I've been the biggest hypocrite in this room. But Lord, charge, change me. Help me not be a quitter. Wake me up, Jesus. And I pray for you, and I love you guys. You know that, right? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, man. <laughs>